Hello and welcome to World Health Plus Social Good. We're coming to you live from the World Health Assembly here in Geneva, Switzerland. I'm Vismita Gupta-Smith from the World Health uh, Organization's headquarters. And for the next three days, we're going to bring you live discussions with public health experts talking about issues that are on the agenda here at the Assembly. Uh, also, don't forget that you can ask your questions. Just hashtag it, WHA69 and WHA Social Good. Today we're going to talk about uh, one of the most, um, well, one of the most talked and discussed uh, public health issues here, also a big public health threat. It's been described a threat at par with climate change and terrorism by some. It's called antimicrobial resistance, a complicated name for a complicated situation. And last year at the World Health Assembly, governments came together to endorse the Global Action Plan to tackle antimicrobial resistance. Here to talk to us about the issue and about the Global Action Plan is WHO Director General's Special Representative on Antimicrobial Resistance, Dr. K.G. Fukuda. Welcome, Dr. Fukuda. Thank you. It's a difficult uh, concept to wrap one's brains around, so could you please decode it for us? Sure, I think the word is a little bit intimidating, but I think the basic situation is something that everybody can understand. Right now, what we're seeing is a major threat developing around the world to families, to communities, to countries. The scientific issue is that we are now seeing a broad range of infections become uh, resistant to the medicines that we use, basically become untreatable. These are not esoteric infections. We're talking about urine infections, blood infections, pneumonia, sexually transmitted diseases, HIV, TB, malaria, a broad range of infections. What this means for people is that there are now more and more people getting infected uh, with things which can't be treated. And consequently, some people have to stay in hospitals longer, and many people are going to die. So more people are dying now. So this means that we are beginning to see around the world an increase in people staying sick longer. There are some really important implications out of them. One of them is that uh, we rely on these medicines, antibiotics, to be able to do things like surgery safely. People get heart operations, mm -hmm. get uh, hip replacements. Mm -hmm. um, when women undergo childbirth, we depend on having antibiotics available mm -hmm. to give them a safety net. When people develop chronic diseases like diabetes, they're more prone to getting infections. We use them to protect these people, people with HIV. So this is one big impact, and it may change how we have to think about medicine. This is going to cost a lot of money. If people are in hospitals longer, it just takes more to, to treat them, it takes more to use second-line drugs, third-line drugs. But also, once you begin to see um, children die, young people die, this means that the productivity in countries can be expected to go down. To put this in some kind of round numbers, it's been estimated by the year 2050, we may see more people die from these in kinds of infections than from cancer. If we look at one country right now, they are having 23,000 people die each year and spending $55 billion per year. It gives you a kind of sense of the amounts of money. That's a scary situation. Uh, what needs to happen to, to preserve uh, these antibiotics? Well, I think to, um, to put this in context, if we look at why are we in this situation, mm -hmm. we're overusing these medicines, misusing them in both health and in agriculture. Mm -hmm. In many countries, we don't have the right systems, for example, surveillance or regulation to deal with the issue. And also, we're not making enough new medicines to keep up with the problem. So I think that what this means is that what we need to do is increase the awareness of people around the world. Right now, many people are just confused about it. There is a blueprint about what to do, the, the Global Action Plan, and we need, need to put it into action. And then finally, we need to get the political engagement and the financing to uh, implement these plans. Tell us more about the Global Action Plan. How does it address this huge issue? Well, the Global Action Plan was adopted by the Health Assembly one year ago mm -hmm. here. And what it represents is the consensus scientific opinion of the best minds around the world 
but it also represents the consensus of multiple sectors. So we had experts from agriculture, as well as from health, as well as from other sectors come together and say, what does the world need to do? And that's the blueprint. It basically lays out all of the activities we need to do to curb this issue. And that sounds like an ambitious plan, which is going to trickle down to countries which, who will also have who, their own national plans to tackle uh, antimicrobial resistance. We'll talk a little more about that later, but let me take some questions from our viewers. I'm going to go to Pinky Patel from UN Foundation. Pinky, do you have questions for us? Thanks, Vasmita. Yes, we do. Our viewers would actually love to hear the personal opinion about what worries you most in addressing antimicrobial resistance, and alternatively, what gives you the most hope? Dr. Pagoda? This is a really good question. What gives me the most hope is that when we lay out the issues, there is nobody who says this is a small problem. Mm -hmm. The scope of everybody being at risk, families, relatives, everyone that you love actually being endangered by this issue quickly brings everybody around the table. What scares me the most is that because it's a complicated issue, we have to make sure that we deal with each of the complexities but not lose sight of the big picture, not lose sight of the fact that this is basically something which is harming people and not to get sidetracked with issues um, that may detract from that attention. Dr. Fukuda, you touched, about, uh, touched upon the use of antibiotics in livestock. How does that impact human health and how does that contribute to the problem? Sure. I think agriculture, like human health, is caught in a kind of a bind. On the one hand, uh, agriculture depends on having effective antibiotics to treat sick animals. Animals get sick and we also depend on that ability to have a sustainable food supply. So we need effective antibiotics. On the other hand, a huge amount of antibiotics are used by agriculture. In some countries, up to two-thirds of antibiotics are used by agriculture. Some of these are for treating sick animals, but some of them are for non-health purposes, basically as growth promoters. And we feel that this is helping to fuel uh, the development of AMR. Dr. Fukuda, very quickly, tell us what you expect to come out of the um, uh, high-level meeting on AMR in September at the UN uh, General Assembly. Sure. Well, as I mentioned, we have the blueprint for what to do. We know what to do. What we really now need are the heads of states to come together and say, we see that there's a big problem, we see that there is a solution for this, and we are going to give our political engagement, we are going to pro uh, provide the commitment and the financing to make sure that the, the plan can get be implemented. And that's really what we hope to have come out of the high-level meeting in September. Thank you very much, Dr. Fukuda, for taking the time and decoding uh, antimicrobial resistance for us. So that sets us up nicely uh, for the rest of the show. Actually, we are going to now go to uh, a tape, a recording of Ms. Daphne Deckers, television host, a model from Netherlands, who was speaking at, on the sidelines of a ministerial conference on AMR. Let's hear what Ms. Deckers has to say. I became ill, and uh, the doctor thought I had a bladder infection, and, they gave, and he gave me antibiotics but it never really went away, and they thought I had multiple bladder infections, but after months and months and months, um, it became clear that um, my bacteria was multi-drug resistant, and uh, to treat this type of E. coli bacteria that I have, or had, I hope, um, there are eight different types of antibiotics available, and seven of those do not work anymore. So I'm on number eight now, and uh, this works so far but it makes you also a little bit nervous because you start wondering what happens if my bacteria learns to defend itself against antibiotic number eight as well. You know, what are we going to do then? And then I started researching it and then I found out. That is a scary situation, one that is becoming all too common, unfortunately. Now, the UK government 
commissioned a review of antimicrobial resistance, and the report of that review came out last week. Here to discuss the report and the review with us is the head of the review committee, Hala Audi. Welcome, Hala. Thank you for having me. Sure. It seems that the review's findings uh, also focused on the economic impact of inaction on antimicrobial resistance. What does it cost the world to not act on AMR? That's right. We worked with two teams of economists under the leadership of our chair, who's a macroeconomist, Jim O'Neill, um, to model what it would mean for the world if you let drug-resistant infections rise, such as malaria or resistant tuberculosis or rise in resistant in HIV or E. coli or pneumonia. So we modeled uh, nine of these diseases and found that by 2050, you could lose as much as a hundred trillion dollar of accumulated output. That means between now and 2050, you would lose the equivalent of one and a half the size of the economy in lost output because more people had lost their lives to these drug-resistant infections and weren't working. So, of course, it's the human cost that matters most, 10 million lives by 2050. But that adds up to an enormous economic cost that policymakers need to uh, take into consideration and act now. 10 million lives by 2050, that is a staggering cost. Tell us something, some more uh, about your key findings. So first, I want to say that antimicrobial resistance is a problem today. And if you worry about 10 million lives in 2050, we should also all worry about 700,000 people dying today, every year, from drug-resistant infections. And that's 200,000 from TB alone, uh, which resistant TB alone. Um, at, at the heart of our findings is a market failure and a policy failure uh, that leads to the rise of drug-resistant infections. And that's because on the one hand you have a lot of people suffering in their health or dying from lack of access to antibiotics, while at the same time there's a lot of excessive use of antibiotics in other sectors. Um, so we overuse antibiotics in humans. Um, one staggering figure is in respiratory issues. Uh, when we go see the doctor for something respiratory with symptoms, we, as there, there's uh, academic estimates that two-thirds of people are getting antibiotics unnecessarily. There's also a lot of waste in agriculture where we're giving antibiotics for no good reason because it might be le leading to growth promotion or instead of having better farming practices. And that's not a good place to be when those drugs are losing effectiveness. Hala, I want to talk more about the recommendations uh, from the review, but first I want to take some questions from our sure. viewers. Pinky? Yes, Vismita, a lot of our viewers are asking, is there an ideal way to dispose of antibiotics to prevent antibiotic resistance? That's a very good question, and unfortunately there isn't one answer. Uh, but the most important thing when you dispose of antibiotics, what you want to have in mind is you don't want the antibiotic, the active ingredient, to meet bacteria, because it's when bacteria meet uh, drugs and antibiotics, uh, that they get used to the antibiotic and they develop this resistance. Uh, and so that's the most important thing about disposal, whether it's at home or in a hospital, you have to do it in a way where the active ingredient isn't going to meet the bacteria, which is very often in wastewater um, because of uh, uh, where these places are. But it's also really important in manufacturing plants when, where we produce pharmaceutical ingredients and antibiotics are let to go into the rivers uh, near the plants without being treated. They can often meet the sewage system uh, of you know, the next city near that manufacturing plant. And that leads to a lot of bugs meeting a lot of drugs and therefore resistance. That's a really scary uh, thought that needs to be tackled urgently. That is a fascinating and scary scenario, a lot of bugs meeting a lot of drugs. I'm going to uh, quickly ask you about your uh, recommendations to tackle this very scary situation. So we have ten, a 10 point action plan and I won't go through it, but to uh, name just three of them, there's one on the demand side. We need to use our antibiotics better and to do that we need to modernize the way we prescribe them and we need to come up with rapid diagnostics that can help inform uh, the judgment whether you 
you need an antibiotic or not. It is not acceptable that we do it based on your symptoms or my symptoms or my kids' symptoms. Um, the way it was done 50 or 60 years ago, given the advances in technology in so many other places. Um, we also need new drugs. It's not all the it's not the whole solution, but we do need new drugs in TB. It's incredibly urgent and important. It is also incredibly important for a number of bacterial um, uh, infections, uh, and we have very specific proposals on how to do that. And finally, uh, we need better public awareness. I mean, it's incredible how much people know about AMR in uh, the world of health and healthcare, and how little people know about it outside the world of health. And I think we all need to uh, make an effort to convince governments to start what is a truly ambitious public awareness campaign. So this is not some uh, hard to pronounce word that nobody understands what it's about. Thank you very much for coming and talking to us about this very important review. So clearly, public awareness is a very big part of tackling antimicrobial resistance. In fact, last year, Anti Antibiotics Awareness Week was observed for the first time globally. Let's take a look at a video from that campaign. Some uh, simple messages on public awareness, but clearly there remain a lot of challenges on the ground. And here to talk about the challenges that countries are facing in tackling this very complicated issue uh, is, uh, is Ms. Precious Matsoso, Director General of Department of Health in South Africa. Welcome. And Dr. Poonam Ketrapal Singh, Regional Director for WHO Southeast Asia Region. Welcome. I'd, I'd like to start with you, uh, Ms. Matsoso. If you could please elaborate on what are the challenges challenges in South Africa and how is the country handling it? Well, the first is that um, South Africa is one of the countries that responded promptly to the global plan May of I action. May I ask you to hold your mic a little closer, the, sorry. The global plan of action mm -hmm. on antimicrobial resistance. Mm -hmm. We were quite enthusiastic in that in 2014 we invited all stakeholders to a meeting where they signed a compact, a declaration that everyone is going to respond and play a role in fighting antimicrobial resistance. You probably know mm -hmm. the biggest challenge in South Africa is that we've got a triple burden mm -hmm. of, un of resistance. Resistance to antiretrovirals, resistance to anti-TB drugs, and resistance to antibiotics. We call it triple burden. Now, with that kind of a burden, with a high burden of disease, obviously, you have to bring everybody on board. And one of the things that we did was to sign that commitment when we came up with a strategy, our framework strategy to fight antimicrobial anti resistance. We have one, a governance that involves a different, it's a multi-stakeholder governance structures with a drive for stewardship. The nice thing about stewardship is that it's not government driving this. It's an association of doctors and a group of nurses who are driving this because our view is that if you want to make a difference in hospitals, it must be doctors and nurses who are involved. And we also have checked up our surveillance systems, so our lab services are also part of that network. And we will not win unless we have education and advocacy in particular that of patients by raising their awareness. So we just completed an awareness a survey to check whether do South Africans really know what antimicrobial resistance is about? Do they know that it's actually not good to ask for antibiotics when you have flu? 
Uh, do they actually know that they can demand their doctors to wash their hands before they touch them? So we've actually introduced those preventative measures and we've started work on um, awareness campaigns in hospital settings, uh, for professionals and also for patients. I want to come back to South Africa and talk a little more about it. Let me come to you, Dr. Ketrapal Singh. These challenges that Ms. Uh, Mutsoso is describing are not unique uh, to South Africa. Many countries uh, are facing that. Your region actually uh, is a home to a quarter of the world's population and a huge disease burden. What are some of the challenges you're facing, your countries are facing? Well, uh, countries of this region, the Southeast Asia region, do recognize that AMR is like a ticking tom time bomb. And the safety net that was created by AMR is now fast eroding, and therefore immediate action is needed. They recognize that. The challenges that we really face in the region are multi-sectoral collaboration, because it's not confined just to the health sector. Mm -hmm other sectors are also involved. So we need to get the animal sector, the agriculture sector, the environment sector involved. And that at times becomes a challenge at country level. And that is something which we are trying to address. The second major challenge is regulation. That is a major challenge there. And there are prescriptive practices which need to be regulated. There is across-the-counter sale of antibiotics which needs to be regulated. These require regulation, and many countries of the region do not have that kind of regulation, though I must say that they are cognizant of it and some of them are moving on it. So I do think that um, to address all this, uh, one does need to think of how more research could be done, how innovative approaches could be adopted, and how countries of the region could uh, plan and see how these various sectors could move forward together. So I'm hearing coordinating across sectors as one of the challenges. I want to take a question from our viewers now. Pinky? A lot of our viewers are very curious to know, what is the level of public awareness about antimicrobial resistance in the countries of your region? Let me start with you, Ms. Matoso. Well, like I said, uh, we conducted a survey and the results were released uh, uh, late last year. Uh, there is some level of awareness in South Africa about antibiotic use, um, but I think it's, it's not to the level that we want. Um, the biggest challenge um, is that South Africans still think that uh, they can demand uh, an antibiotic if they have flu. And that's, that somehow tends to put pressure on doctors. But what I like is that we do have a good regulatory system. We restrict prescription, but that on its own is not enough because it doesn't stop doctors from using antibiotics um, when they are put under pressure. But we also have bad practices by doctors, by the manner in which they prescribe. I mean, one of we, we got one of the prescriptions with 17 different antibiotics, for instance, prescribed for one patient. And I actually said, you know, if this patient took all these antibiotics, I don't think that patient is alive. Yeah. So that tells you that we need something more for doctors, meaning we need to change just that aspect in the manner in which we regulate. The same way as we regulate drugs, we may need to regulate antibiotics the same way. Clearly, awareness and uh, awareness at different levels, at the level of the user, the practitioners, the policy maker. Let me come to you, uh, Dr. Ketrapal Singh, I've got about 30 seconds. If you could talk about the level of awareness. Um, as far as the ministers of the region go, and we do need high level political commitment to move forward on this, there is awareness. And it, uh, it goes back as far as uh, 2011, when the ministers of the region got together and adopted a declaration in Jaipur, which has been guiding our work on AMR in the region. And there was a follow-up meeting, which was held in Jaipur in 2014, after three years, to see where had we reached with it. Now, to quantify the level of awareness that you mentioned in different segments is very difficult to say, because yes, 
people. We've never had a survey to quantify it to see that what is the level of awareness. But we do know that there are gaps. For example, there are people who would not know that a regimen of antibiotics has to be taken, say, for seven days for it to be effective. They may just drop it in three days when they are feeling they are fine. And there are doctors also who prescribe antibiotics for even something like a common cold, which is not necessary. And therefore, I think this kind of awareness needs to be created more. It is, there would be some who are aware and some who are not. So we need to focus more, which we are trying to do in the region, on raising the general level of awareness of people and also having some kind of capacity building for the medical practitioners, for the vets, for others involved in the sector to see that, yes, all of them do follow the practices which would help us to contain the problem. Thank you very much, both of you, for taking the time. I know you're very busy at the World Health Assembly, so we, we do appreciate you joining us here today. So you just heard how countries are uh, actually attacking the problem and attacking it from different angles, uh, multi-sectoral coordination, public awareness, reaching out to different stakeholders, and, and making them aware of their role in tackling this issue. However, while countries are working to preserve the existing antibiotics, Antibiotics. New antibiotics are actually not coming as fast as they should. We need, we urgently need new antibiotics in the pipeline. And here to talk to us about this issue is Dr. Peter Baer, Senior Advisor at WHO. Welcome, Peter. Uh, my question to you is, is this really the end of the road for antibiotics? Is this a, is such a dire situation that we have no other options coming up? Well, we do hope that we can still turn around the wheel, but it is true that the R&D pipeline is pretty empty. We are not seeing the antibiotics we would need to see uh, coming to the market to replace actually the antibiotics that currently are losing their, effect uh, their, their um, effectiveness against um, the um, bugs. Now, if this is such an urgent need, why are new antibiotics not being produced? Well, that is not, there's no one answer to it, but there are a number of aspects. First, the easy ones have been developed very early, years ago. So to develop a new class of antibiotics, it's a long-term investment. It will take you um, a number of years to develop a new drug from scratch to actually until it reaches the bedside of the patient. And it's also um, a, a huge financial investment. So if companies that um, develop new drugs are looking at where they should invest, they might actually decide to invest into um, research and development efforts in areas where they can make a bigger return on investment. Because antibiotics, it's a crowded market, you have a lot of antibiotics on the market, it's not a chronic, it's not covering chronic diseases, so the return on investment is not that attractive. I want to uh, take some questions from our viewers at this point, Pinky. We have a very interesting question about how to balance access versus excess. How can we make sure that we're providing antibiotics to those who need them without in, while ensuring appropriate usage? Peter? Yeah, we are speaking actually a lot about conserving and appropriately using the antibiotics we do have to actually um, delay resistance building. But it's true what the question that was raised, we also have to ensure that people who need actually these antibiotics, they actually have access to them. Because currently there's still uh, um, hundreds of thousands of children dying of diseases like pneumonia that could be treated with very cheap antibiotics. So we do have to work on ensuring access, but also also uh, try to better use the antibiotics we currently have and that we hopefully will develop. I have about 30 seconds if you could tell us about the discussions that are expected to happen here at the World Health Assembly on AMR. Well, tonight um, we are launching actually a new project together with um, a not-for-profit organization called Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative, and that is a, a product development partnership that is hopefully going to make a contribution to fill the research and development pipeline for new antibiotics. 
Well, thank you very much and, and you know, congratulations for, on your work and good luck for this very important work. So there you have it, a very important and serious public health threat which is getting a lot of urgent attention here at the World Health Assembly. The WHO Director General, Dr. Margaret Chan, described antimicrobial resistance as a slow motion disaster which will t reach a tipping point where it will be difficult to, to reverse the harm done. And let's hope it doesn't come to that and we can preserve the efficacy of antibiotics for our future generations. We're we're going to have to stop now, we're out of time. But tomorrow we're going to talk about sustainable development goals, the world's new to-do list for a fairer and healthier world. So don't forget to join us from the whole team here. Bye-bye.